This meeting is now being recorded. All right, and so today's webinar is um, on field studies. And uh, we have a few different projects that have been going on over the last couple of years across Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And so we thought today would be a good time to share some of the results from those projects. Um, originally, uh, one of the primary goals was to uh, think about uh, catching up the field testing data with the lab testing data that we were um, in, a, in a position where we had a lot more data on laboratory testing uh, and we wanted to get more data on field testing. But at the same time, what we were able to accomplish with these um, field testing studies was also to get some data that would shed some light on the ongoing standards process um, and develop some new ideas on methodologies and metrics, uh, which we'll talk about today. And then also to think about how do we measure stove stacking, uh, different usage of a usage of different stoves together in a household, and how do we integrate the usage data with the emissions data? And so at this point, I will turn it over to our first set of presenters. Michael Johnson and Charity Garland are joining in from California, and they will be talking about um, their studies of emissions uh, in field performance in Asia and Africa. Um, and they are from the Berkeley Air Monitoring Group. Oh, just joking. Um, okay. I, I don't think we'll cut the very beginning of what I was saying, but I was just thanking Rainey for uh, the introduction. Um, so I'm going to be talking about or Charity and I are going to be talking about emissions performance from our studies in Asia and Africa. Um, and as you can see from this first slide, it was a, it was a big study with lots of different partners involved. Um, so we're really excited to get the, the data out there for people to be able to see what we measured and, and get an idea of what we did. So what we're presenting today um, really comes from two projects. There was a project with the Global Alliance, uh, which was called the Cook Stove Emissions Performance Survey. And then there's another project, which we did with the U.S. EPA, um, Cook Stove Testing, Training, and Technical Assistance. And these two projects were very complementary. So we thought we would combine the results because a lot of the same methods were being used and a lot of the same metrics were being measured. Um, and as I said, um, there were a lot of common goals. So here are a few of the shared objectives between these two um, programs. So number one, we, as Rainey said, we really want to get more data on field-based tests um, of stoves and see how they're performing in homes. And this is important because one, we want to know how far we're getting towards clean cook stoves. Are we, are our stoves clean enough to be, um, you know, health protective or you know, reducing emissions uh, enough to um, have a climate impact, things like that. Um, this data is also important for technology designers and program implementers to know how their technologies are, are doing in the field. Um, outputs from studies like this can also be used for air pollution and climate modeling. Um, and then, uh, again, as Rainey said, we're hoping to have a better link between the lab and the field in terms of testing, and getting data from the field will help in um, relating those two types of tests and hopefully help uh, inform our protocols that we're developing in the future, too, to be more representative of everyday testing. And then the second objective um, that we had is building local capacity. So in, in each of these projects, we had workshops or training programs where we um, helped local, local groups build up their technical capacity and also did some equipment transfer. Okay, now I'm going to pass it over to Charity, who's going to take you through the methods and some of the results. So the testing that we did during these projects is a test that we called an uncontrolled cooking test, or UCT. And this is in contrast to a controlled cooking test, or a CCT, that is a lab-based test that I think a lot of us are familiar with. 
Um, so this test allows us to measure emissions and fuel consumption for a given task or cooking event. And this test is conducted in participants' homes, um, and they're asked to cook whatever meal they, they'd like to choose and prepared in the way that they naturally would. So this is in contrast to the controlled cooking test, where um, it's still local participants typically, however, they're given a standardized meal to cook. Um, so they would cook only one type of, of food or two types of food, and all the cooks would cook the same thing. For an uncontrolled cooking test, um, they would cook breakfast, lunch, dinner, make tea, whatever they chose to do um, during that event. And uh, during this event, as uh, the researcher, we weigh all fuel before and after the event, and in this way, we're able to look at the fuel consumption used for that cooking task, um, as well as think about the total carbon that's emitted. And in this way, we're able to measure the emission species directly over the stove, as is shown in the photo on the right. Um, and so we sample a fraction of the plume that's being emitted from the stove, and we're able to use the carbon balance um, to scale up the emission species proportionally by knowing the amount of total carbon emitted. And um, the metrics that we're able to determine from this test are emission factors and emission rates of, uh, of uh, pollutants such as carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, um, particulate matter that's smaller than 2.5 microns, which is important for health implications, uh, and then methane, total non-methane hydrocarbons, black carbon, and organic carbon, which are important species for climate effects. And as I mentioned before, we're also able to uh, to calculate the fuel consumption per task and calculate the modified combustion efficiency, which is uh, the ratio of CO2 emitted versus carbon monoxide and CO2 combined, which gives us a good indication of how this stove is, is operating, how cleanly it's burning. And then finally, we're also able to determine fi average firepower over the cooking event. And so this is um, the amount of energy used per, per time. Um, which is a good indication of how the stove is being operated. So looking at what stoves we, we sampled, you can see here that there are quite a number of stoves that we collected field data um, with these two programs combined. Um, and the photos are shown here at the right. Uh, in Uganda, we studied Satellite Home Stove, which is a force draft stove that has a thermoelectric generator, which powers the fan. Uh, and this stove was tested against the three-stone fire in Uganda. Um, in photo two, you see the LPG, or liquefied petroleum gas, stove, um, which was assessed as a, a um, replacement for charcoal stoves. So the displacement of charcoal was assessed in Uganda. In Kenya, uh, you see in photo three, the Chico Koa, which is a um, natural gas charcoal stove and was assessed against the Kenyan ceramic Chico. Uh, in India, we were sampling two force draft stoves, uh, the Orja, which is a pellet stove, uses pellet fuel, and the Eco Chula, which uh, can also be used with pellets, but was typically used with wood um, in our study. And these stoves were both assessed against the, the Chula. Uh, in Benin, we looked at the Eclair stove, which is a natural draft charcoal stove, um, made out of repurposed metal, and it was assessed against a, a charcoal stove called the Soport. And in northern Vietnam, we looked at a rice husk gasifier, which is also a force draft stove that uses rice husk as fuel. Uh, and that was assessed against an open fire with a great uh, pot rest sitting over it. And finally, we uh, studied the high efficiency stove, um, so it was named in southern Vietnam, which was a natural draft charcoal stove that had been modified with um, a, a spot at the top, which is not shown here, for use of wood, so it was um, assessed with both wood and charcoal use. Mm -hmm. So going into some of our results, here we have a, a plot of fuel consumption versus firepower. So fuel consumption is shown on the y-axis as energy per standard adult meal, and standard adult is a convention for normalizing for um, the amount of food that, that one person eats. So a woman is weighted less than a fully grown man, which is um, greater than, say, a child. And so fuel consumption is a, a good indication of fuel efficiency, so how 
much fuel is required for achieving a given task. And then on the x-axis, we see firepower. And as I mentioned before, that's an indication of the stove operation, so how much energy is needed um, over time. And so you can see here that um, there's this positive correlation between firepower and fuel consumption, um, indicating that uh, a, a stove that needs to be operated at a higher energy over time requires tends to use more fuel. And also, uh, you see that the different stove types are somewhat clustered. So uh, natural draft wood stoves are on the higher end of firepower and fuel consumption, where you see charcoal stoves um, closer around the origin with lower firepower and fuel consumption. And just to, to note here, um, you see that many of the traditional stoves tend to use both higher um, – need have higher fuel consumption and – and are operated at higher firepower. So moving on to emission rates. Um, so emission rates are a really valuable metric for assessing stove performance. And it's been used in the ISO International Workshop Agreement um, to determine what the indoor emission uh, tiers of performance will be. Um, to be able to begin to characterize how a stove is performing um, and start to standardize that performance. And so here there's an image of um, the emission rates for carbon monoxide and PM2.5, and then some common stove types and actual data for these stoves. And um, I, I meant to mention before, so these are our medians. Uh, the, the points are, that are plotted are medians, and the error bars are the inner quartile range, or the middle 50% of the data collected. Uh, and so you have the four common stove types, um, a natural draft wood stove, charcoal stoves, forced draft stoves, or often called gasifiers, and then um, liquid or gas LPG stoves. And so the tiers of performance for indoor emissions uh, have been determined based on water boiling test results. And as I'm sure many of you know, WBT's water boiling tests are lab-based uh, performance tests. And so the way that these tiers have been set are based on WBT data. So plotted here is uh, the performance of these stoves from water boiling tests. And you can see that tier zero has been set kind of right around where these traditional stoves are, are operating. So a three-stone fire um, will be tier zero. And then the tier four performance has been set at, um, at the aspirational um, World Health Organization uh, indoor air quality guideline goal. And so this is linked to health, and it's the only one of the four tiers that's actually linked to health. And then the other three tiers um, are uh, spread between tier zero and tier four. And you can see here that the stove type fall evenly, are distributed evenly across these tiers um, with improved stoves, uh, with improved stoves um, falling within these uh, improved tiers, the tier one, two, and three, and then you see LPG up around tier four. Um, so it's just important to, to remember that these are lab-based tiers of performance, and, and lab performance is not characteristic of field performance necessarily, and, and Michael will get into that uh, further in our presentation. So taking a look at some of the data that we've actually collected from these, these field studies, you can see that it's not quite the same even distribution as the, as the previous plot. So our, uh, our traditional stoves are way out here deep in tier zero. And then the forced draft gasifiers are sort of all clustered around tier one with very few actually achieving tier two or three uh, performance. Um, so because of this, we have uh, used a, a framework under the ISO IWA um, that is called the Rosetta Stone. And so this is a method of of turning different tiers of performance for different protocols into um, and equating them in a way that we can characterize them under different tests of the same stove. So um, a tier three stove, uh, and this, so if you look at this little image, uh, really um, 
well-performing tier three stove that emits very low emissions and has um, uh, tier three characterization on, under the water boiling test, uh, we want to be able to characterize that as a tier three under a field protocol as well. And as we saw in the previous plot, they didn't necessarily equate. Um, the stoves weren't falling about off the tiers in the same even distribution as, as with the water boiling test uh, performance plot. So using this, this framework for um, setting different tiers of performance under different protocols, we were able to um, determine some of our own field-based tiers of performance that would show an equivalent characterization as uh, the water boiling test performance test does. So um, you can see that all of the field tiers are higher than the lab-based tiers, except for tier four, which is, uh, has remained constant because this is the only one that's linked to performance, and it's very important that we keep this tier four based on um, the health impacts that it that it should and needs to achieve ultimately. So with these new lab-based tiers of performance, um, let's take a look and see how it change, changes. So we have all of this, this uh, performance data, the CO and PM emission rate, and the IWA tiers uh, down here at the bottom left, and the distribution is, is rather uneven. And now if we look at the field-based tiers of performance, it looks much more similar to um, the, the previous, the primary plot of the water, the water boiling test. Uh, performance. So now you see even distribution that's similar to uh, the initial plot of the water boiling test data. Um, and up in the top right corner, you see our traditional uh, natural draft wood stove just right on the tier zero edge, uh, tier one, tier zero edge, and then the improved natural draft wood stove, the high efficiency wood, has just achieved tier one performance. Uh, our charcoal stoves up on the Upper left are all clustered with really um, improved particulate matter emissions, but those charcoal stoves just have a very hard time achieving reduced CO emissions because of the nature of their combustion. Uh, so those stoves are still tier, tier zero due to the CO emissions, but you look down at our, our force draft gasifier stoves, and they're sitting right around tier two, tier three, as um, they did for the water boiling test classification as, as well. Um, so this is just looking a lot more similar to the way that IWA uh, water boiling test tiers of performance classify uh, the, the stoves. And um, we think that this is a really good way of starting to translate how field-based data can, can uh, be used to characterize stoves. And um, Michael will now get into the, the differences in lab and, and field data. Okay, thank you, Charity. Um, so on this next slide, uh, we plotted a comparison of modified combustion efficiency for the different stove classes. Um, and we've done this not just for the data that we've collected, but um, everything that we could find that was available. So in this plot, which has modified combustion efficiency on the y-axis and then um, the different stove classes across, um, each one of these data points represents a test set. So, for example, one of these data points might be the result of three water boiling tests from Jim Jetter's um, most recent round of testing. Or um, in the field performance, it might be from 15 tests of uh, Orgis stove, for example. So this is actually a lot of data that's being um, represented here. And then just to clarify a little bit further, the lab data is the light blue, and then the field-based data is the dark blue. So looking at this plot, there are a couple different trends that are interesting to point out. Um, number one, there we go. Um, there's a consistent overestimation of combustion efficiency in the lab compared to the field. So looking at traditional wood stoves, rocket wood stoves, force gas fires, the different charcoal stoves, and even LPG, although it's such a small data set and um, a really small difference, there's an apparent overestimation um, of modified combustion efficiency, which is something that we would um, expect and have seen um, over time as well, just because the conditions in the lab are generally idealized compared to what you see in the field. So that's one trend. The other trend that we see is 
that you have increasing combustion efficiency across stove types for the stoves that you would expect, whether it's in the lab or the field. So um, going from a traditional wood stove to a rock of wood stove to a forest rat gasifier, if you're looking in um, the lab, you see an increasing uh, kind of training combustion efficiency, and then same in the field. It's just all shifted down a little bit. And charcoal stoves are low in combustion efficiency because they produce a lot of carbon monoxide, and then you have your gas and liquid stoves with the highest uh, combustion efficiency, which you would expect as well. All right, and then um, this is a slide that I think is really interesting. Um, we plotted our emission rates uh, of CO and PM, and we plotted each event that we have. So each one of these data points represents one event with whatever stove we have, and, and, and we separate into wood and charcoal. And so the blue and purple is wood, and the orange and um, red is charcoal. And we've plotted our results, but we've also plotted the results from Jim Jetter's data set from his last round of testing. And what we see is, regardless of whether you're in the field or the lab, you get pretty much the same relationship between PM and CO emission rates. Um, and so if you look at the slopes of these, for example, for wood, you see 87 for, for Jim Jetter's data, and we had a slope of 100 um, and fairly strong correlations. And so what this tells us is that it, we're seeing pretty much the same combustion processes producing similar emission rates, but in the field, we're probably seeing more events causing higher emission rates. So the same things that are causing those emission rates, like startup and shutdown and, and pending practices, um, those are going to be perhaps more frequently occurring in the field or for longer durations than what we see in, in the lab. Um, and we think this is exciting because it means that if you can characterize those operational conditions very well, um, then you might be able to say, oh, well, we see, you know, um, people tending their stoves at X rate in the field, and then just based on laboratory data where we're seeing some tending as well, maybe we can just scale up those emissions associated with those events to better match what we're seeing in the field. Um, so it's just a, a, a supportive data of an approach of taking some lab-based data and maybe applying it towards more realistic conditions um, in the field. And then the other thing that I didn't write up on here but is also interesting is from a health perspective, a lot of people look at CO as a proxy for PM and when they measure exposure, because measuring PM 2.5 is really hard for measuring personal exposure, but CO is really quite easy. Uh, and this graph tells us that these relationships are pretty strong for fuel types. So if you know how much uh, charcoal stove is contributing to the air pollution and exposure, and you know how much a wood stove is contributing to the air pollution and exposure, you might be able to use a CO as a, as a proxy, as long as you characterize um, your source as well. All right, and I believe this is the last slide of our results, and this is about black carbon and its climate implications. Um, and so we have emission factors on the y-axis in grams per megajoule, and then the different stove types um, across. And this is just from our U.S. EPA projects. We weren't able to measure black carbon or organic carbon um, during the CEPs projects. So this is just from the EPA projects. And um, we've plotted the total carbon, which is, the organic carbon and the black carbon, and, and that's the top of each bar, and then the fraction of black and organic carbon as well. And the reason why it's important to differentiate is because black carbon is, is quite warming and organic carbon is cooling. So you can't just look at the magnitude of carbon or black carbon that's emitted. You need to look at the ratio of these two species and if they're changing as well because they both have climate implications. Um, so what we see from this graph is that at um, as we would expect, the traditional stoves, the Uganda Three Stone Fire, and then the traditional Chula or um, and India, they both have the highest carbon emissions uh, because they have the highest PM emissions. Um, and then the other stoves in either the charcoal stoves or um, the forest draft stoves, they all had much lower total carbon emissions. 
And, and in most cases, they have lower black carbon emissions, too. That big blue square, is, uh, or the dark blue square, is reduced in most cases. But the ratio of black carbon to organic carbon wasn't consistent. So just for example, when we measured the ecochula with pellets, um, although it had much lower carbon emissions, it had um, a very high black carbon to organic carbon ratio, which means that it's the particulates or the aerosol it was producing was more warming than the traditional chula um, per unit mass. Um, so it's not clear whether or not that was having climate benefit or not. Um, there's a lot of other stuff you have to do to actually figure out if there's a climate benefit. Um, but just based on this, it shows that you need to be careful about just saying, oh, well, there's a reduction in black carbon. That means there's a climate benefit. That's not always the case. Okay. So just some concluding thoughts. Um, how clean are we? That was one of the goals. We wanted to know how far we're progressing towards getting really clean cooked stoves. And the good news is that in almost all cases, we saw fairly substantial reductions in emissions, especially for PM2.5 and CO, which is um, good. Um, we definitely like to see that improvement. Uh, but we also know that we need to do a little bit better to get down to really low levels, especially the health levels. Um, for cell biomass stoves. There's still progress to be made there. And then LPG, as, as we saw, did have quite clean emissions at the tier four level in the field. So that was promising, and that represents a technology that's available um, right now. Of course, that's challenges as well, but at least it's good to confirm that it had excellent emissions performance in the field. And then, um, as Charity uh, showed with the field tier set performance, um, and again, this is just illustrative. We're just putting out an idea. Um, but it's nice to have some guidance around performance of stoves based on field performance. Uh, and hopefully it's more constructive and illustrative of how stoves are doing compared to one another um, under real-world conditions. Um, and then, um, you know, as we've been saying for a while, we really need – testing approaches to do a better job of predicting field performance. And we think we have some data that will be helpful along those lines that we presented here. And then finally, um, and this is going to link into Ilse and Omar's talk, which they're going to give here, um, we only measure the performance of stoves during single cooking events, uh, which is really important for knowing how a technology is performing and, and doing in the field but it doesn't give you a good idea of how effective that technology is or how impactful it is. In order to know how impactful technology is, you need to know how often it's used and the different combinations of uses in the home. So if you integrate usage data with performance data, you might get a better idea of how effective that technology is being at the household level, seeing its um, overall impact. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what Ilse and Omar have to have say. So I believe that is it for us. Um, we have lots of people to thank, but uh, you guys can check this out um, when you have time. There are lots and lots of people that were involved, and uh, we thank everybody for listening and look forward to your questions. Um, I think that's going to do it for us. We must have lost Rainy. Anybody out there? What do they call this on the radio? It's the, um, uh, you know, when there's silence on the radio, it's bad news. Sorry, Michael, I was talking while muted. Um, I wanted to thank you and Charity for presenting the results. And it sounds like you can hear me now, and I'm unmuted. Um, and while we uh, get set up with the next presentation, um, we'll, we can take a few questions now. We'll also have um, time at the end of both presentations to have a little bit more discussion as well. Are there any questions for Michael and Charity about their presentation?
All right, Jim, perfect. I think this is um, an issue that uh, will be uh, – We'll, we'll need a lot of discussion on this, not just today, but in the future as well. Um, Jim says, um, you showed how tiers for field results could be adjusted to match lab results. What do you think about adjusting tiers for lab results to match field results? Can you, can you repeat that one more time? I can quite understand which way are the tiers being adjusted? You guys... Um, proposed new uh, tiers for the field results to match, or so that the, the tiers for the stoves in the field would align up with what they were showing in the lab. Jim is asking, um, how about adjusting the existing tiers to better match what is being seen in the field? It's in the chat window as well. I only see Kate's chat window. Um, so I think, if I understand correctly, I mean, so what tiers would you have to have in the lab then to get equivalent tiers in the field, perhaps? Um, which would mean, I think it would mean you would need much lower tiers in the lab to get the same performance levels in the field, um, which would make very small tiers um, in the lab. But I'm not... I, I'm not quite sure if I understand exactly what's being asked. Michael, if you not. switch the chat to everyone instead of just to Kate, if you pull down that drop net, you'll be able to see Jim's question more specifically. A related question that came in from John Mitchell is, uh, what recommendations do you have to make lab testing more representative of field testing? So I think John is asking about changing the lab methods, and Jim is talking about changing the lab tiers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I think a really exciting idea for lab testing is to use a more distributional approach where you look at a range of operating conditions, and then you weight or scale what you're seeing in terms of emissions and fuel efficiency to match those same conditions that are measured in the field. Um, that way you could have, you know, a limited number of operational conditions that you measure in the lab. You don't necessarily need to have 100 different protocols. You just need to make sure that you measure under the right, under the key operating conditions, and then you weight those based on what you see in different areas um, so that it does represent the, the cooking cycle or the, the, the tasks that people are conducting in the field. Um, so it's something that I think a few different people are pursuing that's similar to the approach that um, Colorado State is working on as part of their APA star project, and we're going to be helping them with. Um, and I think some others are are looking at that approach as well. Yeah, and I think the idea of how do we how do we or do we define tiers in the lab, and when do we use them, and how do we use them? I think that's going to be. Um, something that we'll have to continue to discuss. I don't think that answer is very simple. Um, we should move to the other presentation at this point. Um, we do have two two questions on the cost related to specific stoves or to the cost of the studies. Michael and Charity, can you give a quick answer on that? And then I would also recommend that um, the people interested in that uh, connect directly on some of this as well. So there's a question on how expensive is the Eco Chula pellet stove, and then um, what are some some elements of costs in, in general to co conduct these types of studies? Um, yeah, I think the Eco Chula costs between fifty and sixty dollars USD, um, and in terms of the cost of the study, um, we use a, quite a bit of equipment that's, uh, that we reuse for these kinds of emissions tests that uh, aren't cheap. Um, I don't know, Michael, do you have any like, yeah, let's, ballparks? Let's, this sounds like it'll take a little bit more time to answer well because it, it could get very detailed. So let's, yeah. Yeah. let's have 
these people connect directly with you guys. I also see another question on IWA tiers. Um, let's save that for the end so that we give Omar and Ilse enough time to present. Um, but we, we have a record of this question. Let's try to address it at the end. If not, we can also cover it after the webinar as well. Um, so at this point, we're going to turn to Ilse Ruiz Mercado and Omar Macera with UNAM um, in Mexico, and they'll, they're going to be talking about these elements that um, Michael and Charity's presentation um, kind of is, is uh, growing into and bridging to related to measuring usage, uh, stacking, and displacement in, and connecting that to in-field performance. So Ilse and Omar, take it away. Oh, we need to unmute you guys. Hello, can you everyone hear me? Yes, you are coming through now. I see. This is Ilse Anomar from the National University of Mexico in Mexico and from the Interdisciplinary Group of Rural Appropriate Technology. Thank you, Ranji, and everyone for uh, hosting this webinar. Well, to begin with, we would like to um, we have a roadmap for the presentation. For the sake of time, we have a long, a short, it looks a short agenda, but there are many issues we want to discuss. So for the sake of time, I'm going to go through the presentation. My oh, mic here. And we'll have some discussion points at the end. Um, so to begin with, we would like to start taking a step, a step back and just think again about what we are talking here when we say performance and stacking or usage. And just to frame the issue, we want to go back to the basic question of, or take you to the basic question of the traditional fires. What are they used for to begin with, which is the reason why we are talking about clean cook stoves? Well, it's really important to remember that the end uses that the traditional fire satisfies extend well beyond cooking. So when we say stoves, or when we talk about the stoves, taking over um, these fire needs, the fire needs to begin with are much bigger, and we can write here a list, but most of us know drying clothes from just practical purposes to very different spiritual needs or um, the spiritual religion, healing, water heating, gathering together, space heating. So we, all, we all know this, but it's important to remember it. Second point, so the traditional fires and the stoves that are used for all these uses, even within cooking. What are they used for when they are used for cooking? So the second point is the tasks. And we need to remember that cooking is not only heating food, unless we're only talking about reheating something that was cold or frozen. But regularly in the context that we are talking, cooking is a combination of tasks and techniques, all the way from boiling, frying, steaming, uh, grilling, and I can go on and on. And each specific technique or, or task has a specific energy demand, also demands for the cooking, diva, the cooking vessels at times, temperatures, but also it has a specific social and cultural relevance. And we need to remember this. So in this, uh, in this scenario, what are the clean cook stuffs, what can they be used for? And what we want to show is that they have a very specific niches within this argument that we are building. So clean cook stoves can satisfy because they are necessarily optimized for uh, either fuel savings or cleaner emissions, but they can only satisfy a, a subset of the, all the end uses and tasks that we, are, we were talking. So it is seldom that the clean cook stoves are perfect substitutes for all the traditional, for the, all the, need, uh, for the traditional fuel devices that are present in the home. We need to be very clear about this because this sets the stage to understand what is the niche, uh, number one, what is the niche of the, our clean cook stove that we are presenting, how many of these needs we are satisfying with this solution. But most, the point we want to arrive is what is the definition, what performance we are talking about, uh, what is the frame of this performance. So given that the fires that the needs that the fire satisfy are more than just cooking. Even within cooking, the cooking tasks are many, and not all the stoves can perform all of them. In particular, not all clean cook stoves may be able to excel at all of them. We have that often many of the fuel cook stoves 
will be, many will be needed to satisfy all, all these uses and cooking needs, leading to what we call the stacking or the combined use of multiple stoves. In this sense, as I was saying, performance, when we, when we talk about performance, when the fuel and the stoves are stacked, uh, each of them will find a specific niche in the tasks that it best performs. But it, that if it best performs, we want to go back to this phrase, it best performs according to what definition of performance? So it, the task that is best performed with the boiling five liters of, of water on the uh, water boiling test or on their acidity. And um, as many know, the answer is that it finds a niche on the task that it best performs according to the user, which is the ultimate uh, person doing the decision of if the stove is useful or not. So as much as we want to um, by find our measure the performance of our story in terms of certain metrics. We always have to, we always have to go back to remember that the user is who is going to do the ultimate decision of what performance means, and the decision is made by using it and by by how it is used by if it is used for all the tasks or for only some of them. So um, these concepts are very important. Then uses the task and the niches. Uh, how do we find these niches, and how are um, the stoves, uh, when they are stacked, uh, how are they used, and what this has to do with performance? With these questions, questions in mind, we um, we started this project funded by the GAC. Uh, with a, there is a lot, uh, many institutions involved in it: University of California, Berkeley, Irvine, the Inkland Trust in India, and the Ramachandra University. Each of them, and us, the UNAM and HIRA in Mexico. The project is larger than when I'm going to just give an overview of a specific component for the sake of time. And within each uh, a specific partnership, they have separate funding that is supporting this effort. So the funding for the part that we're, the part we're showing is uh, supported by the GAC, but there, are more funding, there is more funding involved. The main project objective that we want to cover is this question of measuring usage, stacking, and displacement of the stoves to understand what are these connections between the connections between infill performance and the lab measurement. It's, um, I'll quickly just mention it's a, the full study is a comparative study with partners in uh, doing a, a study in the a study site in Haryana, India, and we are doing one in uh, our part in Mexico. Both of them we have have intensive usage monitoring in about 100 households. Different scenarios. Um, we'll concentrate this presentation of the results from Mexico, and hopefully we have another chance to talk about the comparative results later. So in terms of the Mexican side, um, it's a, a very heavy, it's in the central part of Mexico, in Michoacán, very heavy fuel wood users. But there is access to LPG, but at different uh, penetration rates. And we measure both, as we were saying, emissions and usage. So for emissions, the methodology is very similar um, what's done with uh, Professor Rufus Edwards at UC Irvine, and probably similar to what um, uh, Michael explained. And we also got emission factors and emission rates, CO, CO2, PM2.5, methane, and uh, others. Also the modified combustion efficiency. But what we are going to um, focus is on the usage uh, um, results that we got. So in terms of methodology, we use uh, questionnaire surveys, but mainly uh, the stove use monitors, uh, small, very quickly small sensors that can be placed on the stoves and give you temperature traces that can be analyzed so that you get metrics of usage. We develop a full methodology that is in itself another topic for another webinar. Uh, but we develop a standardized protocols that are very important so that you get data that can be consistently collected and, and analyzed. And in terms of metrics, the uh, sums give you a full range of resolution all the way from how many days the stove was used to how many, for how many cooking or fueling events, and with a detail of how many minutes per day or how many hours per day. So we focus on that metric uh, to try to understand the relationships that we were saying between field and lab. And the methodologies that we outline, uh, you will see, so I'll walk you now through the results. Um, it's a very, it, the methodology will uncover many complexities of a stacking, which is the main message we want to convey. It's not as easy as saying a stacking equals X number. It has many more dimensions. Um, but basically, we, uh, from all the stoves, we 
identified in the region the cooking task and the end uses. We already know, I'm not showing it, but we are, this region has been studying for a long time, so we already know that the main cooking task is tortilla making and other tasks related to tortilla making. And the end uses are mainly cooking and a little bit of water heating and uh, uh, some, sorry, some uh, water heating and a little bit of ambient heating. Then we classify, we find all the stoves and classify them, find the clusters, and I will show you, and some found how um, we found the patterns of how stacking was happening. Uh, not only what stop with what stop was being stacked, but what patterns of usage we found to understand how this uh, affected performance. So we found um, surprise number one, or not surprise, but it's just uh, still uh, so something interesting that we found more than 15 or more than about 20 configurations or phenotypes of phenotypes of stoves. Um, many different types of traditional stoves, as you can see on the left side. Uh, other set of chimney stoves and gas stoves. Uh, uh, we can cluster them in three, three categories in terms of how they are used. But in terms, let's say, of measuring in detail with the sums, we did need, we did need to do a detailed uh, phenotype classification to standardize all the placement. And people that have been using the sums know what I'm talking about. So we found these three categories. With three categories, uh, you have nine, um, about nine possibilities. But we have got to analyze the data. I'm, I'm giving a leap here. But we analyzed all the sums data and to see what is combinations were actually present or used. Um, and from the nine, we saw that only five clusters were present. And the clusters are um, as defined are, are, as ways to combine stops, so to say. So these are groups of users, and they are read in this little drawing that we made in the horizontal, uh, in horizontally. So 37% of the population stacked the gas stuff with a chimney type stuff. 20% only the, had only the chimney, and so on. So we can see the partitioning of our population. And we can see uh, here, it's very interesting to see, and this is hard data, it's data from the sums, and this is uh, almost a year of data or several months. Uh, we can see how we find groups that are that completely displace uh, the, the traditional type of fires, groups that are the stack, so combine, combine but different types of combinations, fire and chimney, the three stops, or gas and chimney. And how there is definitely still a group with residual use. So these are the three elements that we will be talking about when we quantify usage um, and stacking, displacement, stacking, and residual use. But even, even within, within each cluster, how much is, is, each, is each stop used? And we are plotting this in this uh, graph. So we have the same five clusters that we have here, same colors, the blue for the gas, the green for the chimney, and the gray for the open fire. The same uh, clusters, and the number in here is the average daily hours that uh, that group was uh, using that stove. Um, so we see for the population it's about 7.2 hours that the stove is uh, used. Um, and we can see that there are different, the, the two groups that are using exclusively, and they have, interestingly, interestingly enough, they have similar usages, uh, usage levels. And we can see uh, groups that stack. Something there are many dimensions to this graph. You, you will have time to, to see it in the notes and, and think or send those questions or ask questions. But one point is, as I was saying, there is residual usage. So to begin with, we in this population, for example, there is not a group with exclusive use of gas or a fuel switch. There is a, fuel, a switch or complete displacement to chimney. But when we see the um, residual use of the fires, we still see between 1.8 hours and between two and four hours, daily hours of uh, open fire usage. So even if we have a very high or uh, sustained usage, because this is, uh, as I was telling you, several months, uh, representing several months, even though we see four or five hours of daily usage of a chimney stove, or even three hours of the gas stove, we still have a very important component that has impacts in terms of performance from many perspectives. It will have impacts on the actual emissions from the house, in the concentrations for health uh, purposes in the house, and also is the fuel consumption. But even within each cluster, let's say, or even within each category, um, are all the, I'm gonna start on the other side. Okay. Can, all, can the same level of usage mean different impacts? 
So as I was telling you, we were going to show you little by little all the complexities. Um, so even if we say, for example, I'll explain you this graph. If we say we take, if we were to take two houses, data from two houses, and this is data from the sums, which means the uh, vertical axis is temperature. We are not interested in the, in the scale now; it's just temperature. And um, the horizontal axis is time. So in the left side, we have two stores that are being stacked. That's why I put them that way. Fuel goods in pink and gas uh, on the bottom, on the top. They are stoves that are working at the same time with the sums place at the same time in each stove. And so this is simultaneous data. This is a, a stacking in the um, monthly scale. On the right side, we have another house, the same, stacking of fuel gold on the bottom and gas. But this is at the weekly scale. So these are different patterns. First, because this, the first one on the left happens at the seasonal level. So you can see, and it's alternating. So it, first you, wish, you see the gas stove was used. There was a gas shortage, so the house ran out of gas. But luckily, they, had, they still had a way to use a fuel gold stove. So they start, as soon as they, got, they run out of gas, they start using the fuel gold stove. Um, they keep using it for several, for a couple of months, and then they uh, have again access. They get, regain access to gas, and they continue to use gas with, some with still some residual use of um, the fuel gold stuff that we learn uh, from the other questioners and, and visiting the house that is for tortilla making. So this is a very typical situation of many regions, but particularly in Mexico, preserving, even though uh, houses have access, full access to the modern stoves or the LPG stoves, they still preserve the fuel gold stuff to preserve the traditional practices, in this case, tortilla. On the right-hand side, on the, uh, on the other side, <laughs> we have um, stacking at the weekly level or at the day within every week. So the dotted lines are show, show divide weeks, so we have like two and a half weeks shown here in the graph. And in this, uh, in this graph, we can see how um, the gas stove is used every day for satisfying the three meals. And on the bottom, at the same time, we have on black, remember the black is the fire and the red is the uh, chimney stove. We have one day they use the uh, fire and then they use the chimney. They use the fire, they use the chimney, and they alternate. Some days they use two days the, the fire, but pretty much they alternate day and day. This is because this traditional cooking task that is uh, anchoring or driving the stacking in this case is the tortilla making, as I was saying. It's a very strong uh, cooking task in Mexico. This, this task requires boiling corn on an open fire, and then, and then you can uh, make the tortilla. So you need to have the ingredient before. So quickly, what I want, want to show is that these two houses, very different stories, uh, very different usage impacts at different times. If you, you don't measure the full cycle in the left, you get a very wrong idea. You can measure in between and have 100% usage of fuel, go fuel stuff, fuel good, and uh, zero success, let's so to say it in terms of gas. If you measure at the end, you will have the opposite that it will be incorrect. If you measure the picture that I show, you measure 50 and 50, but if you consider the whole year, which is the data we have, this house is actually 85% of use in terms of gas and 50 in terms of chimney. They, they don't have fire. The, these exact numbers in terms of the 85 and the 50 are the same ter long-term usage of the house on the right. So. The same, the same numbers, even from the sums, even long-term usage, even if you have the numbers, the same numbers meaning very different impacts. Um, and also what I was saying in terms of the residual usage for a traditional task, um, just a question, is all residual usage, all residual usage has negative impacts? Because in this, in, in this example, and this is uh, something that can be quite common, this particular task that anchors or maintains the fuel good is what keep, keeps up the maintenance of the stove so that when there is a gas shortage, uh, the, the houses can have resilience to afford going back to the stove, which is still in working condition. So the scenario is more complex than those just aiming for a full, uh, full switch or a full displacement of all the stoves or thinking that maximizing the impacts, um, it's on, the only way to maximize impacts comes from eradicating all the fires. And this, as I was saying, has very critical uh, implications. 
the most important point, which is what we took time to uh, start with the slides of framing the issue, is to understand that when the new stoves uh, in, enter the homes, and we, we talked about this before, each, each stove finds a, finds a specific niche in the task that it best performs across to the user. But this redefines the system, and this is an indicator in terms of now some tasks are switched between stoves. So we cannot only do a before and after uh, a comparison. We need to, to look at the end users and tasks and in what stove each, uh, each was left off. This is a strong indication that the system, the performance that we are interested in is the system performance. So it's not only the technology, but it's the technology, the user, and the fields interacting. And, um, and this just has three the interesting, three, three interesting points that we say. So when the stacking happens to satisfy all the needs, there, the, it, it's very uh, unlikely that a single stove a strategy will displace all the fires from the home. Then this means that we will have residual usage of the stoves, and even when the new stove is loose in the long term. So we need both of the things. One, a, strong, a larger or broader portfolio of solutions, not only technical solutions, maybe improve cooking, stove, cooking practices as well to satisfy these, um, these residual uses the, or to mi mitigate the residual uses. But more important for performance, this means that measuring field performance on only one cooking event that we choose or the house choose on, on one stove is very different from understanding the performance of the stove in the main cooking task when all the stoves are, when we consider the overall performance of all the stoves in the system. So overall performance that is done with the purpose of ensuring that there are impacts, which is what I think all the purpose of monitoring performance is, uh, most focus on looking at the main cooking tasks, and this includes measuring all the stops in all the main clusters that you find in the population through the seasons or relevant seasons if there are seasons in your population. So just giving a single, prescribing a single recommendation of we need to uh, aim for this percent of usage without putting a context of main cooking tasks or inducers or we need to displace or eradicate the fires, the trees on fires by this percent, will not be sufficient. We need to go beyond probably multi-criteria uh, indicators and be more creative to get a broader, um, more informative guidelines. And, w yeah, and with this, we conclude. So, uh, many to show you the complexities of stacking, and we just thank the, all the houses that participated in our study. All the field teams, as I said, this is just one component. The study is larger, and it has many institutions, so we thank all our project researchers and all the field teams in both uh, houses, in both uh, study, study sites. And we have uh, some list of words reading. So with this, we conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Ilse, for that presentation. Um, that, that is a lot of good food for thought on how do we evaluate, why do we evaluate um, usage and stacking and how are the cooking technologies addressing the different needs of a household. Any questions for Ilse? Maybe while people type questions in, Ilse, I have a question for you on, on some of the emissions data and what, what do the, um, the concentrations and the emissions look like under the different uh, stacking scenarios. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit more about uh, the results that you saw? Yes, um, I can either, yeah, maybe while we get another question, I can send a slide and may, I don't know if we have time to, to upload it. But, uh, so what we did, which I'm happy you, you asked this question, uh, so we took these clusters or different profiles of usage and then uh, multiplied it by the different uh, performance of the different stoves to try to link these emissions and usage. So in, and in this exercise, which is also very complex in terms of measuring precisely the, uh, the fuel emissions, or sorry, the emissions of every cluster or subtype. Uh, in the preliminary results, we found also, that, as we found earlier in Mexico, that the uh, field results are consistently lower than the lab results. So the lab overestimated in this exercise that we 
that we did. Um, and we also find we also found that um, the emissions from the households that stack more, that stack more stoves are the highest. The overall emissions. Um, so that was one of the and, and of course I mean something. Uh, let's see if I can send you the, the slide or I can uh, show it somehow. But of course the, the stoves that stack with the LPG in terms of emission emissions they, they will have the lowest. The LPG is such a small contribution. Um, but we find that within groups that stack, uh, they have the highest. And we are still working on, on the data to find if the difference is really significant, which is why this is why we we, um, we, didn't, we weren't sure to present because it's preliminary data. The, the stacking, let's say the last the last cluster, the cluster that stacks um, the stove and fire, has a greater, but we are not sure of that. So I, I am uh, Omar. Just to one interesting finding uh, is that uh, even even if you have the best uh, uh, advanced cooks, so this is something that we found in also in, in India. Not necessarily you get the lower total emission at the household level. So it, it depends on the way you are stacking the the different uh, stoves and, and 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 even fuels. No, in the case of India, because they use dung as well as, as fuel wood. So. Having having the an LPG stove or in this case the Philips stoves, I think it was in India. No, not uh, it's not uh, doesn't assure you that you will get the lowest total household emissions. So it's more about how these stoves are integrated and how much are they able to displace the the traditional fires, no? Some uh, for which particular task. So we found that, for example, some stoves that are not on, uh, on uh, in, in terms of emission factors are not so good, but they they are used a lot more than the, the more advanced, and so at the end they have more impact, no total impact in terms of household emissions. And this is something I think need is a very good thing to for further discussion, no? What what would be the that has to do with adoption, and not only to the performance and in terms of uh, per, per kilogram of food or or per per meal, no? In terms of Thanks. We also have another question, um, and it probably for would be relevant for both presentations. So I've unmuted all of the presenters, so you guys should be able to speak up. Um, do you see any consequence of your results for the current carbon reduction measurement methodology? Um, sure. This is Michael, and. Um, I would. I think there are a lot of results that are really important and interesting, potentially for the carbon markets and the methodologies that are being used, um, especially with, with stove use. Um, but what's allowed in the CDM methodologies and the gold standard methodologies, none of the approaches that we've used here are are mandatory and often are beyond um, or would add additional costs to what. Um, program implementers have to do already. Um, we would love if emissions had to be measured directly and if stove usage had to be measured directly. I think that would add a lot of credibility to the data. Um, but right now, that's not required. Um, so we would hope that future methodologies incorporate some of these approaches. Um, but right now, uh, I think generally, project implementers for, for carbon projects are going to look at uh, what's the most cost-effective way to do their, their carbon monitoring, and, and these approaches are probably not the most cost-effective, um, although in some cases, perhaps, there are uh, times when, say, study use monitoring could be effective and, and cost-effective. Yes, I, I agree with, with Michael. And in fact, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem because in many cases, the, 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 even the emission factors or, or well, the data used for to to calculate emissions are based on only on on a comparative emission uh, stove efficiency with regards to LPG or other very simple ways to to get to the to the final results, and and not everyone is is uh, asked to to really measure the actual performance of, 
the talks in particular emissions and usage. So I think there is a lot to improve. We also have a question about the applications for stove design. Does the stove stacking analysis provide information that might be useful for further developing stoves to cover more of the end user needs? Yes, this is Ilse. I think it's a great question. Um, so that's why it's really important to see at the end users and, and practices that are that satisfy the fire as a baseline uh, in the population, and then identify this visualized niche. So you can see it as a let's say just a background, and then the niche of each sort of is like a little patch that is patching the area of all the fires. So once you identify every stove, what, what uh, the area that is patching, and that you have an idea, let's say, if it is water heating and that one is very intensive, or it's uh, something like Virginia making, which is not only intensive for fuel, but also for exposure because people are very close, then you can tune in terms of identifying, and this is not even work with the stones, it's just basic communication with the community, which is why we think uh, very important this participatory development of the design to, under to understand uh, what needs need to be addressed to, to cover all the impacts. And this is not, not any different. I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise again for any of us. It's the same way you in the morning have a coffee maker and a microwave, and then you have your uh, uh, toaster oven for the bread, and then you make your uh, eggs in the gas stove. So it's not any different. If I were to just give you one single stove, some of us will struggle satisfying all of them. So it's more about understanding. That's why we took you at the beginning, understanding what we're talking about, what are the needs. But it's a great uh, question in terms of going back to see exactly the niche that our stuff is, is find, uh, fulfilling and what other impacts are being left, uh, left uh, on. Thanks for these questions. Keep them coming in. Um, I apologize. I know we have gone over a little bit uh, the time that we originally scheduled for the webinar. Um, and sorry for the people who had to leave early, but we will be posting the full recording of the webinar. Another question just came in. Um, do you expect that the current development of health-related crediting um, see work by Kevin Newcomb and the World Bank or, or health impacts investment uh, perhaps uh, may lead to such kind of requirements for combined crediting options. So the um, question is, uh, you've got that, Michael? Sure. I can, I can try. Um, and I think what Ken uh, Newcomb and Kirk Smith and uh, I think um, – some others, Yeroon and the Bix, um, the Bix. Yeah, maybe not. Anyhow, I, I a lot of people are interested about trying to figure out a way to to credit some type of health-related metric. Um, and it would be nice if there were financial incentives to promote the technologies that we're doing the most for health. Uh, but right now, the methodologies for that and the uh, just the way the markets could potentially work for an approach like that are very exploratory and getting worked out. Um, so I do think there is potential, and hopefully when we come up with a system that does reward those shows for doing the best in terms of reducing health-damaging pollutants. But um, whether or not that happens is, is I have to say. Um, the, the carbon markets are kind of tough right now with the price of carbon, so it would be really nice to, to have a new – um, source of revenue, um, especially the one that was linked to health impacts. And another um, piggybacking off of that last question, um, it raises, uh, this is from Sumi here at the Alliance, Sumi Mehta, um, the, the question is about um, how much can we bridge between field emissions um, and exposures? and even to health impacts? Yeah, that's another really good question. One of the things that has been done very little has been measuring emissions and exposure simultaneously or in a coordinated systematic study. And it would be really nice to get a better idea of 
exactly um, what the implications are for exposure from changes in stove performance and stove use. Um, and, and that's something that we don't have very well characterized, but it'd be great to know um, at least put some bounds on what we could expect in terms of exposure reductions associated with different performance levels and usage rate. Um, but as far as I know, there aren't many or any studies out there that have really looked at exposures and emissions at the same time. Um, but it's certainly a, an important research area. Yeah, I would will, I will like to add to that. And in fact, I think there's much more need to focus on the uh, studies at the household level rather than at the stove level. This is something we really need to, I think it's one of the critical areas. And we try to, well, we we be, began with, with that issue and, and tried to link uh, precisely stove emissions with, with usage. We couldn't do the, uh, go further with the exposure uh, data, but I think it's, it's basically uh, at the end, the impact will depend on, on the combination of all these stoves, emissions, uh, and, and, and usage. So for, for understanding what is going to be the overall, you know, impact of different types of stoves, we will need to, to do more at the household level. And so, so I really, I, I suggest that a, a, a new line of, of research should, should really focus on, on this uh, issue. And that has to do with, the, as Michael said, Measuring multiple stoves, at, uh, not only in terms of usage, but emissions simultaneously. Not that is the case we we found in in Mexico, and it's a tricky thing. But I think we we really should put more into that because at the end, this is where what will define the the impact of the program. And this also relates back to the discussion that we started, but didn't get anywhere near finishing um, after the first presentation about the. IWA laboratory-based tiers and the proposed um, field-based tiers, the idea with the um, tiers of performance was to give a proxy for what we could more easily measure and tie to technologies um, and provide guidance and, and specific targets for where we want technology to go with the idea that it, it is then related to um, exposures and health impacts. Um, but of course, doing those health measurements can get quite expensive. So what is the balance between having appropriate guidelines that combine the laboratory and the field, um, emissions, the usage, the stacking um, in as informative of a way and as efficiently as possible to provide guidance to people? So I think that's, that's an ongoing question that bridges both presentations and some of the discussion that we've had. So it looks like there aren't more questions coming in. Um, at this point, what we'll do is um, wrap up this webinar. I think there are a lot of issues, um, future work that's been proposed, future discussion that I think we still need to have on, on how do we balance these trade-offs with what we can measure and providing useful information. Um, but thank you so much for everyone uh, for joining this webinar. We'll be posting this online so that it will become part of a continuing discussion on some of these issues relating to doing studies in the field, what are the impacts for technology development, for standards development, for how we measure impacts broadly on these clean cooking activities. Um, so uh, stay tuned also for future webinars as well. And thank you so much for all the presenters for sharing their results. And I, I think that um, we're, we expect to see a lot of these uh, projects continue to um, trigger interesting discussions in the future as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Randy. Thank, thank you, everyone. Also. everyone. Thank you. Take care.